Torture is absolutely more prolific than people realise. I think if people realised the extent of torture, they'd be absolutely horrified and shocked. It can break people into a thousand pieces so they can never rebuild themselves again. And that's why it's so fulfilling working with torture victims to be able to see the small pieces of themselves come back together is just the most beautiful thing in the world. Torture can take all forms. It doesn't just have to be the torture that you would imagine seeing on a film. It can be emotional, it can be physical, it can be designed to break people spiritually. It's a form of coercive control to elicit fear. It is actually illegal in globally recognised law, yet it is happening all over the world. It's a mass controlling mechanism. So if you're going to torture a group of individuals, you are going to make them scared, which will therefore make them compliant. Individuals are tortured for a whole plethora of reasons, not just knowing secret information. It could be for exercising their basic human rights. It could be for protesting. And it could just be for being part of a society that gets in the way of a political regime. It could be for their sexual orientation. Women who are perhaps teaching females in a country where this is not allowed by the current government. There are so many horrible and inhumane ways to torture somebody. So there's physical pain, which could be limb amputation, fingernails being pulled out, beatings, whippings, genitalia burning. There's deprivation of food, water, sunlight, social isolation. When you deprive somebody of things that they're used to, it takes away the time of day. Certain markers in somebody's day that you would use to understand what time it is, what location you're in, if you take those away, it becomes very, very, very hard to create a routine for yourself, which creates confusion. Certain regimes might seek to torture individuals in places that can't be seen because they understand that the asylum process in other countries needs to see physical evidence and marks and scarring. People are often detained and then showed footage of their family or pictures of their children walking to school. While many people haven't started their journeys in Europe, they've ended up in Europe, in camps in Italy, in Germany, in Turkey. Some have come through Libya where they've been through enforced work camps. I have quite a strong issue with the term economic migration because I really don't believe that anybody grabs maybe only one of their ch children and gets on a boat and comes to the UK for eight pounds a week to live in a really scary, dark, noisy hotel room. Many people are trafficked or enforced to board vessels with no contact of family, no friends, no money, no food, no means of income, no papers. They then arrive in the UK they don't speak English, they don't know where their family are. To have to navigate a system which, in a hostile environment, that's not set up to support them, is absolutely terrifying. And the proposal to send people to Rwanda, I am absolutely appalled and outraged that as a country that prides himself on being opening and welcoming, that we are threatening to send really vulnerable people on a further journey into the unknown to a government that we don't actually know is completely 100% stable for them. The most amazing person in the world I've ever met is a young man who can speak five languages because of the journey that he's been on. And he was detained in his home country from the age of about 14 in a cave with a group of other young teenage boys. He was forced to sleep on the floor with no direct sunlight. People were dragged off in the middle of the night. He could hear them screaming, being beaten, having fingers cut off. And then they were thrown back into the floor to sleep with him. He was forced to tie bottles around his genitalia, walk around in circles while people routinely beat him with the butt of rifles at 15 years old. He's come through all of this, managed to escape. He eventually got over to the UK. He was about to be placed on the Bibby Stockholm. To be told he was going back onto a boat and not even be able to step on dry land in the UK was absolutely terrifying. For everybody I work with, the most important thing is sanctuary and safety. And yet when you remove someone from being able to even stand on dry land, that doesn't feel safe or humane.
Torture leaves you with uh, many long-lasting physical and emotional difficulties. And in most cases, diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD can result in flashbacks, nightmares, the body thinking that it's reliving these traumatic experiences time and time again. One of the saddest things I've had to witness is when a lawyer told my client that somebody had sent him some footage of his detention in the Taliban camp. The client, having already been through this experience, was forced to sit and watch footage of when he was detained and beaten by the Taliban. He was kept in a really small cage, deprived from sunlight, guards urinating through the gates on him several times a day. He was blindfolded, not fed, not watered, dragged out several times a day, beaten around the head with butts of rifles and placed back in the hole. Not everybody who comes to our organization has been given a choice about whether they're a victim or a perpetrator. In many scenarios, at a very, very young age, you might be forced to witness family members be killed and never also then be involved in perpetrating yourself. And with no one to protect you at a very young age, you might be forced into slavery, trafficking, or even being a child soldier yourself. When people come to us, they're absolutely broken from the traumatic experiences they've had from the past. Individuals look at the floor, don't trust people, feel very small. When you're able to give them a safe environment, is just the most beautiful thing in the world.